The Call of the Wild by Jack London Chapter 8 The Sounding of the Call When Buck earned sixteen hundred and five minutes for John Fulton, he made it possible for his master to pay off certain debts and to journey with his partners into the east of the fabled Lost Mine, the history of which was as old as the history of the country. Many men had sought it, few had found it. More than a few there were who had never returned from the quest. This lost mine was steeped in tragedy and shrouded mystery. No one knew of the first man. The oldest tradition stopped before it got back to him. From the beginning there had been an ancient and ramshack cabin. Dying men had sworn to it, and to the mine the sight of which it marked, clinching their testimony with nuggets that were unlikely, unlike any known grade of gold in Northland. But no living man had looted his hit this treasure house. The dead were dead. Therefore John Fulton and Pete and Hans, with Buck and half a dozen of old dogs, faced into the east on an unknown trail to achieve where dogs and men and dogs as good as themselves have failed. They sledged thirty miles up to the Yukon, swung to the left in the Stuart River, Passed the mayo and that question, and held on until the steward itself became a streamlet, threading the upstanding peaks which marked the backbone of the continent. Jan Fulton asked little of men or nature. He is unafraid of the wild. Handful sought a rifle. He would he could plunge in the wilderness and fare whatever he pleased, as long as he pleased. Being in no haste for Indian fashion, he hunted his dinner in the course of the day's travel. If he failed to find it like the Indian, he kept on travelling, secure in the knowledge that sooner or later it would, come, it would come to it. So on this great journey into the east, straight meat was a bill of fare, ammunition and tools principally made up, a load and a sled, and a time card was drawn upon the limitless future. To Buck it was boundless delight, this hunting, fishing and indefinite, wandering through strange places. For weeks at a time they would hold on steadily, day after day, and for weeks upon end. They would camp here and there, the dogs loafing and the men burning holes through frozen muck and gravel, washing countless pans of dirt by the heat of the fire. Sometimes they went hungry, sometimes they feasted righteously, all according to the abundance of game, the future fortune of hunting. Some arrived, the dogs and men packed on their backs, wafted f- across blue mountain lakes, and descended on a st- or ascended unknown rivers in slender boats, which soared from the standing forest. The monks came and went, and back and forth they twisted through the uncharted vastness, where no man were, were and yet were men that had been, if the lost cabin was were true. They went across the vines in summer blizzards, shivered under the night sun, on naked mountains behind the timber line, and eternal snows dropped into summer valleys amid swarming gnats and flies in shadows of glaciers, picked strawberries and flowers as ripe and fair as any Southland could boast. In the fall of this year they penetrated a weed lake country, sad and silent, where wildfowl had been, but where then there was no life, nor sign of life, only the blowing chill winds of the forming of ice in sheltered places, and melancholy rippling of waves on lonely beaches. And through another winter they wandered on the obliterated trails of men who had gone before. Once they came up upon a path blazed through the forest, an ancient path, a lost city seen very near, a lost cabin seen very near, but a path began nowhere, and ended nowhere. It remained a mystery as a man who made it, a reason he, as a man who made it, a reason he made it, remained a mystery, 
Another time they chanced upon the tray and grieving wreckage of a hunting lodge. Amid the shreds of the rotten blankets, John Fountain found a long barreled flint lock. Who knew it was from Hudson Bay Company gun of the young days in the northwest? When such a gun was worth its height in beaver skins, plat- flat. That was all. No hint as to the man who, early day, had reared the lodge and left the gun among the banklets. Green came on once more. At the end of all their wanderings, they found not the lost cabin, but a shallow place uh, in a broad valley where the gold showed like yellow butter across the bottom the washing pan. They sought no further. Every day they worked, earned them a thousands of dollars in clean dust and nuggets. They worked every day. Gold was sacked in moose hide bags. Fifty pounds to the bag. Piled like so much firewood outside a spruce barrel lodge. Like giants they toiled. Days flashing on the heels of days like dreams as they heaped the treasure up. There was nothing for the dogs to do save the hauling in the meat of the in of the meat now and again that Fulton killed. A buck spent long hours musing by the fire. Vision of short legged hairy man man came to him more frequently. Now there were there was little work to be done. Often blinking by the fire, Buck wondered if him in that other world which he remembered. The salient thing of this other world seemed fear. But he watched the hairy man sleeping by the fire head between his knees and hands clasped above. Buck saw that he slept restlessly in many starts and awakenings, at which times he would peer fearfully in the darkness and fling more wood upon the fire. Did they walk by the beach of the sea where the hairy man gathered selfish, selfish and ate them as he gathered? Them as he, gathered. he was with eyes that roved everywhere for hidden danger and with legs prepared to run like the wind at its first appearance. Through the forest they crept noiselessly, back at the hairy man's heel. They were alert and vigilant to pair them, eye, ears twitching and moving and nostrils quivering for the man's beard head. Her, for the man heard and smelled as cleanly as buck. Hairy man could spring up into the trees and travel, add as fast as, as on ground, swung by the arms from limb to limb, sometimes a dozen feet apart, let him go and catch him, never falling, never missing his grip. In fact, he seemed as much at home among the trees as on the ground, and Buck had memories of nights of vigil spent beneath trees wherein the hairy man roast, ro- roosted, holding on tightly as he slept. Closely akin to the visions of the hairy man was the cool still sunning in the depths of the forest. He filled him with great unrest and strange desires. It caused him to feel a vague, sweet gladness. He was aware of wild yearnings and stirrings, for he knew not what. Sometimes he pursued the call in the forest, looking for it as though it were a tangible thing, barking softly for defiant, defiantly, as a mood might dictate. He would thrust his nose into the cool wood moss, or into the black soil where long grass was grew, and snort with joy at the fat earth smells. He would crouch for hours, as if in concealment, high in fungus covered trunks of fallen trees, wide eyed and wide eared to all that moved and sounded about him. He might be lying thus, that he hoped to surprise his call. He could not understand, but he did not know why he did these various things. He was applied to do them, impelled to do them, and did not reason about them at all. Irresistible impulses seized him. He could be, he would be lying in a camp, dozing lazily in the heat of the day, and suddenly his head would lift and his eyes, ears cock, up intent, listening. He would spring to his feet and dash away and on and on for hours through the forest aisles, across the open spaces, with a nigger hedge bunch. He moved on the run down dry watercourses as a creep and spy upon the bird life in the inn. The woods. For a day or t- at a time he would lie in the underbush, would watch the partridges drumming and strutting up and down. But especially he loved to run in the dim twilight of summer midnights, 
listening to the subdued and sleepy murmurs of the forest, reading signs and sounds as man may read a book, and seeking for the mysterious something that called, called waking or sleeping, all times for him to come. One night he sprang from sleep, from a start, eagle-eyed, nostrils quivering as if scenting, the main bristling of recurrent waves. From the forest came a call, or one note of it, as a call was many noted, distinct and defiant, as never before. A long drawn howl, like yet unlike a noise made by a husky dog. He knew it in the older familiar ways, as a sound heard before, rang through the sleeping camp, in swift silence dashed through the woods. As he drew closer to the cry, he went more slowly with caution in every movement. Till he came to an open place among trees, and looking out, saw, wrecked on the haunches, the nose pointing at the sky, a long, lean timber wolf. He made no noise, yet it ceased from its howling, tried to sense his presence. Buck stalked into the open, half-crouching body, gathered compactly together, tail straight and stiff, feet failing, falling with unwanted care. Every movement advertised coming led, threatening an overture of friendliness. It was menacing truce at marks of the meeting of wild beasts that prey. The wolf fled at sight of him. He followed with wild leapings in a frenzy to overtake. He ran to him in a blind channel, the bed of creek, the timber jam barred the way. The wolf whirled about, pivoting his hind leg after the fashion of Joe, all the cornered husky dogs snarling and bristling, clipping his teeth together in a continuous and rapid succession of snaps. Buck did not attack, but circled him about the hedge and hedged him in, the, in from friendly advances. The wolf was suspicious and afraid. The wolf made free for, for Buck, made free of him in, his, in wait, while his head barely reached Buck's shoulders. Watching his chance, he darted away, and the chase was resumed. Time and again he was cornered. The thing repeated through. through. He was in poor condition, or Buck would, could could not so easily have overtaken him. He ran till Buck's head was even with his flank, when he would whirl around at bay, only to dash away again at the first opportunity. The end Buck's pink perconsistency was rewarded for the dwarf finding that no harm was tended, finally sniffed noses with him, and they came friendly and plained about in a nervous half coil way. Half coil away with it, which fierce beasts belay their f- belay their fierceness. After some time of this, the wolf started off an easy lope in a manner that plainly showed he was going somewhere. He made it clear to Buck that he was to come. They ran side by side for the sombre twilight, straight to the creek bed, into the gorge from which it issued, across the bleak divide where it took its rise. On the opposite slope of the watershed, they came down into the level ground country where there were great stretches of forest and many streams, and through these great stretches they ran steadily for hour after hour, the sun rising higher, the day growing warmer. Buck was wildly glad he knew he was at last answering the call, running by the side of his wood brother to walls of lace from where the call surely came. Our memories are coming from him upon him fast. He was stirring to them. As of old he stirred to realities which they were they were the shadows. He'd done his this thing before, somewhere in another and dimly remembered world. He was doing it again now, running free in the open, unpacked earth underfoot, the wide sky overhead. He stopped by running stream to drink, and stopping back remembered John Fulton. He sat down, the wolf started on towards the place from which, where the call surely came. Then we turned to him, sniffing noses, making actions, as though to encourage him. But Buck turned about and started slowly on the back track. For the better part of an hour, he worked the wild brother ran by his side, whining softly. But he sat down, pointed his nose upward, and howled. It was a mournful howl, but Buck held steadily on his way. He heard it grow fainter and fainter till it was lost in the distance. 
John Fulton was eating dinner when Buck dashed into camp, throwing upon him in a frenzy of affection, overturning him, scrambling upon him, licking his face, biting his hand. Playing the general co- playing the general Tom Fall, as John Fulton characterized it, while he shook Buck back and forth and cursed him lovingly. For the two days and nights Buck never left camp, never let Fulton out of his sight. He followed him about at his work, watched him while he ate, saw him in his blankets at night and out of them in the morning. But after two days the corner of the forest began to sound more, more imperiously than ever. Buck's restlessness came back to him. He was haunted by recollections of the wild brother. The smiling land beyond the divide runs side by side for the wide forest stretches. Once again he took no wandering in the woods, but the wild brother came, came no more. Though he listened through long vigils, the mournful howl was never raised. He began to sleep out at night, staying away from the camp for days at a time. Once he crossed the divide ahead of the creek, went down to the land of the timber and streams. <coughs> Here he wandered for a week, seeking vainly for the fresh sign of the old brother, killing his meat as he travelled and travelling with the long, easy lope that seems ne- never to tire. He fished a salmon broad stream, emptied somewhere in the sense of sea. By this, this stream he killed a large black bear blinded by the mosquitoes, while lightweight fishing and raging through the forest, Helpless and terrible. Even so, it's a hard fight. It roused the last lament remnants of Bark's ferocity. And two days later, when he returned to his kill, I found a half dozen wolverines crawling over the swell, scattering them like a chief. And those that fled left two behind who would quarrel no, no more. The blood longing became stronger than ever before. He was a killer, a thing that preyed, living on things that lived, unaided alone by virtue of his own strength and power and at rest, surviving triumphantly in a hostile environment where only the strong survived. Because all this, he became possessed of great pride himself, which cocooned itself like a contagion in his physical being. He advertised, it itself, he advertised itself in all his movements, a power and in play of each of every muscle, spoke plainly of speech in the way he carried himself, like his glorious folk coat, if any something if if anything more glorious, but for the stray bound on his muzzles, and above his eyes and for special white hair that ran up midmost for his chest, he might well have been mistaken for a gigantic wolf, larger than the largest of the breed. But from his Saint Bernard's father he inherited size and weight. But it was from his shepherd mother <coughs> who gave him shape to the size of weight. His muzzle was a long wolf muzzle, save that it was larger than the muzzle of any wolf. His head somewhat broader was the head's wolf, a massive scale. His cunning was wolf cunning and wild cunning. His intelligence, shepherd intelligence, and his St. Bernard intelligence, all this, plus an experience gained, a fierceness of schools, made him a formidable and cr- a creature as any that roamed the world. A carnivorous animal, living on a street meat diet, he was in full flower, high tide of his life, men for spinning with vigour and for vitality. When Fulton passed a caressing hand of his back, on his back and snapping and crackling for his hand, each hair discharged his pent magnetism at the contact. Every part, body and brain, part brain and body, nerve tissue and fibre, was key to the most exquisite pitch between all the parts were there was a perfect equilibrium of adjustments. The sights and sounds and vents were quite action. He responded from the lightning like repetitively. Quickly as a husky dog could leap to defend from attack or, or to attack, he could leap twice as quickly. Saw the movement or heard the sound, but in less time than, than any other dog required to comp- compress a mere see- seeing or hearing. He received and determined and responded in the same instance, point the fact that free actions of perceiving, determining, and responding was sequential, but so in fin- finestimal were the intervals of time between them and they appeared simultaneous. His muscles were just surcharged vitality and snapped into display sharply, like steel springs, 
life glistened stream through him, his splendid flood, glad and rampant, until it seemed it would burst him asunder in sheer ecstasy and pour forth great generously over the world. Never has there been such a dog, said John Thornton one day, as the camp partners watched Buck marching out of the camp. When he was made, the mould was broke, said Pete. By your jungle, I think so myself, Hans affirmed. They saw him marching out of the camp. He did not see the instant and terrible transformation which took place as soon as he went was in the secrecy of the forest. No longer marched, and once he became a thing of the wild, stealing along softly, cat-footed. A passing shadow that appeared and disappeared among the shadows. He knew how to take advantage of every corner, recalling his belly like a snake, and like a snake to sleep and strike. He would take a peregrine from its nest, kill a rabbit as it slept and slapped in mid-air, the little chipmunks, fleeing a second or two late for the trees. Fish in open pools are not too quick for him. <coughs> Nor were the beaver mending their dams too wary. He killed to eat, not for wantonness, but he preferred to eat what he killed himself. So looking, humour ran through his deeds. His delight to steal upon the squirrels. And when all had, oh, but, but when he had all, but they, but they had then, to let them go, chattering in a mortal fear, the treetops. As fall the year came on, the moose appeared in great abundance, moving slowly down to meet the winter in the lower, less vigorous valleys. Buck had already dragged down a stray, hot pot grown calf. He wished strongly for larger and more formidable prey. He came upon it one day on the divide at the head of the Calvert Creek. A band of twenty moose had streamed across for about over from the land of streams and timber. The chief among them was a great bull. He was as in savage temper, staying over six feet. The ground was as formidable antagonist as ever, as even Buck could desire. But back and forth the bull tossed his great panelid antlers, branching to fifteen, fourteen points and embracing so many feet from its tips. His own eyes burned with victorious and bitter light, while he roared with fury at the sight of Buck. The bull's side, just forward of the flank, protruded a feathered arrow which accounted for his savageness. Guided by that instinct, which came from the old hunting days, a pro-medial world, but proceeded to cut the bull out. The herd, in no slight task, he would bark and dance about in front of the bull, just as out of reach of the great antlers of the terrible sly hoofs, which could have trampled it, stamped his life out, single blow. And he would turn his back on the fang danger and go on. The ball would be driven into the proxysms of rage. As were well, such moments he f- charged, Buck would treat his car after he him and assimilated in the in ability to escape. And when he was thus separated from his fellows, two or three of the younger bulls would charge upon Buck and enable the wounded bull to rejoin the herd. This is the patience of the world, <coughs> dogged, tireless, persistent of the life itself. It holds motionless for endless hours, the spider web, the snake in its coils, the panther in its abyssicide. This patient belongs particularly to life, where it hunts its living food, learned to buck as he clung to the flank of the herd, retreating, retarding its march, irritating the young bulls, rolling the cows with their half-grown calves, and driving the wounded bull mad with helpless rage. But day after day, he continued, buck motivated himself, attacking from all sides and everything the herd. In a whirlwind of menace, cutting out his victim as fast as he could, it could rejoin its mates, wearing out the patience of creatures preyed upon, which is of lesser patience than other creatures praying. As the day wore along and the sun dropped in its bed, in the northwest and the darkness had come, de- come back, and the full nights were six hours long. The young bulls retraced their steps above the m- more and more rapidly to the aid, to the aid of their beast beset leader. A down coming winter was hurrying them on to lower levels. It seemed they could never shake off this tireless creature that held them back. Besides, it was not hard on the life of the herd or the young bulls that were that was 
that was threatened. A life of only one member was determined, which was of remotest interest than the other, their lives. In the end, they were c- c- content to pay the toll. The toilet fell and the old boy stood with lowered head, watching his mates and the cows he had known, the cows he had fathered, the bulls he had mastered, as they shambled on at a rapid pace through the fading light. He could not follow out before his nose leaped, and with merciless fang terror, it would not let him go. Three hundred weight more than half a ton he weighed. He lived a long, strong life full of fight and struggle. And he faced death at the teeth of a creature whose head did not reach beyond his great knuckled knees. From then on, night and day, Buck never left the prey, never gave it a moment's rest, never read the brows of leaves of trees, or the spirits of young birch and yew willow, nor did he give the wounded bull, wounded bull opportunity to slake his burning thirst in a thin, slender, trickling stream. They crossed often in desperation, once in long stretches of flight, as such signs but did not attempt to stay him, but loped easily at his heels, satisfied. The way the game was played, living down, lying down when the moose stood still, attacking him fiercely, when he strove to eat or drink. The great head dropped more and more under its tree of horns, the shambling trot grew weak and weaker. It's took to stand it for long periods, with nose to the ground, ejected ears, dropped limply, a buck found some time in which to get water for himself, in which to rest. At such moments, panting with red loping tongue, with eyes fixed upon the red ball, appeared a buck that a change was coming over the face of things. He could feel a new stir in the land, as the moose was coming to, into the land, other kinds of life were coming in. Forest and stream and air seemed plemplet for with their presence. The news of it was born in upon in upon him, not by sight nor sound nor smell, but another some other and subtler sense. He heard nothing, saw nothing, yet knew that the land was somewhat different, and through its strange things were afoot and ranging his old investigate after he finished the business in hand. Mitzi Stop it. At last, the end of the fourth day, he pulled a great moose down. For a day and night, he was made by the eat, kill, eating and sleeping, turn and turn about. Then, rested, refreshed and strong, he turned his face toward camp. John Fulton. He broke into a long, easy loop and went on, hour after hour, and there at loss, the tangled way, heading straight home. A strange country for his centitude, direction that put man in magnetic needle to shame. He held on because more and more conscious new stone of land was life aboard it, different from life which had been there throughout the summer. No longer was this fact borne in upon him in some subtle, mysterious <coughs> way. The birds talked of it, the squirrels chattered about it, every breeze whispers of it. Several times he stopped and drew in the fresh morning air. In great sniffs, reading a message from which made him leap at the greater speed, he was oppressed with a sense of calamity happening. If it were not calamity already happened. As he crossed the last watershed and dropped down into the valley towards camp, he proceeded with greater caution. Three miles away he came upon a fresh trail and sent his neck hair rippling and rustling. He led straight towards the camp and John Fulton. Buck hurried on swiftly and stealthily, every nerve straining and tense, alert to a multiverous set of details. We told the story, all but the end. His nose gave way to a varying description of passage of life on the hills of which he was travelling. He marked the pregnant silence of the forest. Birds' life, life, life had flittered. The squirrels were in hiding. One only, one only he saw. A sleek grey fellow flattened against a grey, damp, dead limb, so he seemed a part of it. Woody, its 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 creature sense upon the wood itself. A buck slid along with an obscureness, a gliding shadow. His nose was jerked suddenly to the side, though a positive force gripped 
and pulled it. He followed a new scent into the thicket and found Nig. He was lying on his side, dead, where he dragged himself, an arrow protruding head and feathers by either side of his body. A hundred yards up further on, Buck came upon one of the sled dogs, Fulton had brought in Dawson. His dog was thrashing about in a death struggle, directly on the trail, and Buck passed around him without stopping. From the camp came the faint sounds of many voices, raising and falling, a sing-song chant, bellowing forward to the edge of the clearing, and hands lying in his face, feathered with arrows like a poker pine. Same instant, Buck peered out with a small sprawl lodge, had been and saw what made his hair leap straight up his neck and shoulders. A gust of overpowering rage swept up over him. He didn't know, know what he growled, that he growled, but he growled aloud with terrible ferocity. For the last time in his life, he allowed passion to absurd cunning and reason. It was because of his great love for John Fulton that he lost his head. Ye hats were dancing about the wreckage, the spruce barrow lodge. When they heard a fearful roaring and saw rushing upon them, animal the like which they never seen before, a buck, a live hurricane of fairy, hurling himself upon them in a frenzy to destroy, sprang the full first man. He was a chief of the very hats, ripping the folk wide open till the gent juggler spread a thousand blood. He did not pause to worry the victim, but ripped in pissing the great bound, tearing wide the throat of the second man. There was no withstanding him. He plunged about in their merry mist, tearing, rending, destroying, constant and terrific motion, which defied the arrows they discharged at him. In fact, so inconceivably rapid were his movements, as the closely were Indians tangled over together, they shot one another with their arrows, and one young hunter, hurling a spear at a buck, made air, drove it through the chest of another hunter. With such force, the brute point broke through the skin back and stood out beyond. There's panic seized the hats. They fled in terror to the woods, proclaiming as they fled the advent of the evil spirit. A truly buck was a fiend incarnate, raging in the hills and dragging them down the deer as they raced for the trees. It was a fateful day for the hats. They scattered far and wide of the country. It was only till it was not until a week later that the survivors gathered together in the lower valley and counted the losses, and a buck wearily, wearily of the pursuit, returned to the disolated camp. He found Pete where he had been killed in his blankets. First moment of surprise, Fulton's desperate struggle was fresh brit- written on the berth. Buck scented every detail of it down to the edge of the deep pool. By the edge, head and all feet in the water, they skeeked. Faithful to the last, points of muddy and discoloured from the sluice boxes, evidently hid what it contained. It contained John Fulton, for but for his trace into the water, from which no trace led away. All day, but brooded by the pool and roamed restlessly about the camp, deaf as a cessation, a moment passing out and away from the lives of the living. He knew, and he, he knew, and he knew, John Fulton was dead. It left a great void in him, somewhat akin to hunger, but a void which ate and ate, which food could not feel. The times when he pulls a complete carcasses of Yehets, he got the pain of it, and at such times he was aware of the great pride in himself, a pride greater than any he had yet experienced. He had killed men, and that man, the moment's game of all. He had killed the face of the law, the cub and fang. He sniffed the bones curiously. Curiously, they died so easily. It was harder to kill a husky dog than them. They were no match at all. Were it not, it were it not for their arrows and spears and clubs, they were fenced forward. He was not afraid of them, except when they bore in their hands their arrows, spears, and clubs. Nights came on, the full moon rose higher above the trees into the sky, lightning, lighting the land till they bathed in glossy day. But the coming of the night, brooding and moaning. But there was a pool, but became alive, bestowing a new life in the forest. Over the net, which the Yehats had made, he stood up, listening and scenting. Far away drifted a faint, sharp yelp, followed by a chorus of similar sharp yelps. The moment passed, and the yelps grew stronger and louder. 
again but knew them as things heard and other world which persisted in memory. He walked to the centre of the open space and listened. It was a call, a many noted call, sounding more luringly and compelling than ever before. As never before he was ready to obey, John Fulton was dead, the last tie was broken. Man and the claims of man no longer bound him. Hunting their living food as ye hats were hunting it, on the flanks of migrating moose, the wolf pack had its last crossed over the land of streams and timber, Bailey Buck's Valley, a clearing where the moonlight streamed, and they poured shall we flood at the centre of this clearing, to Buck motionless as a statue waiting their coming. They were in awe to so still and large he stood at moments pools, fell to the modest one leapt straight at for him, like a flash struck, breaking the neck. They stood without movement, as before the stricken wood, or falling in agony behind him. Three others tried it in a sharp succession. One after one on the other they drew back, streaming blood from their smashed throats or shoulders. There was a significant, it is a significant fling, the whole pack forward, pell, pell, mail, crowded together, blocked and confused by its eagerness to pull down the inner prey. Buck's marvellous quickness and agility stood him in good stead, pivoting to his hay and legs and snapping and gashing his area at once, presenting a front that was apparently unknown, so swiftly did he well and guard from side to side. But to prevent them from getting behind him, he falls back, down past the pool and into the creek bed, till he brought up against a high gravel bank. He worked along a great angle in the bank, which a man had made in a course of mining. In his angle he came to bay, protected on three sides, with nothing to do but face the front. And so well did he face it, that at the end of a half an hour the wolves drew back discomfort. Confronted it, their tongues all out of lolling, white fangs seemingly cruelly white in the moonlight. Some were lying down with their heads raised and ears pricked forward. Others stood on their feet, watching him. Still others were lapping water from the pool. One wolf, long and lean and grey, advanced cautiously. A friendly man had recognised his wild brother, for whom he ran for a night, a day. He was whining softly about why they touched noses. Then an old wolf, gaunt and battle scarred, came forward, but withered his lips into primitive a snarl, but sniffed noses with him. Whereupon the old wolf sat down, pointed nose at the moon, and broke out a long wolf howl. They were sat down and howled. All now the call came to Buck in uh, unspeakable accents. He sat down and howled. This over, he came out of his angle, and the pow, pow, crowded above it, around him, sniffing in a half friendly, half savage manner. The leader sniffed the yelp of the pack, and sprang up, away into the woods. The wolf swung in behind, yelping chorus, the back ran with them, side by side, with a wild brother yelping as he ran. And here may well end the story of Buck. Years were not many when the hats noted a change in the breed of Timberwolves, for some were seen with flushes of brown on the head and muzzle, and a rift of white centering down the chest. But more remarkable than this, the hats tell the ghost dog, it runs ahead of the pack. They were afraid of this ghost dog, for its cunning greater than they, stealing from the tramp in the fierce winters, robbing their traps, slaying their dogs, defying their h- bravest hunters. More remarkable than this, you yet to tell the ghost dog that runs the head of the pack. They're afraid of this great ghost dog, for it's cunning greater than they, stealing from their camps of fierce winters, robbing their traps, slaying their dogs, defying their bravest hunters. Nay, the tale grows worse. Hunters with now who failed to return to the camp, are hunters there. A bin whom the tribesmen found with the throat slashed cruelly open, with wolf prints about them in the snow, greater than the prints of any wolf. Each fall when the ye hats follow the movement of their moose, there is a certain valley they will never enter. The women there are who among become sad 
where the world goes over the fire, or how the evil spirit came to select that valley, a binding place. There somewhere there was a one visitor, however, to that valley of which the valley of hats do not know. He is a great, gloriously coated wolf, like yet unknown, unlike all other wolves, because he's alone for the smiling timberland, comes down to an open space among the trees. Here a yellow stream flows at rotten moose-eyed sacks and sinks in the ground with long grasses growing from it, a vegetable mould overrunning it. A hiding is yellow from the sun, and here he moses for a time howling once, Long and mournfully, ere he departs. But he's not. But he's not always alone. When the long winter nights come on, the wolves follow their meat into the lower valleys. He may be re- seen running at the head of the pack through the pale moonlight, the glimmering borealis, living gigantic above his fellows. His great throat a bellow. He sings a song of the younger world, which is the song of the pack.